I'm really pleased to be here. I have to say yesterday was amazing. Um, I think about this stuff all the time, but I was really pushed and stretched and um, had some new ideas and me and my team have already been huddling and talking about how we want to incorporate some of the some of what we're learning into, into our work. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about making Black Lives Matter. And the making part is important because it implies action. And so Black Lives Matter is a great slogan, but it has to be more than that. It has to, to mean action, and it has to mean intentionality about um, everything. And so um, I loved the um, protests that happened nationally in the summer of 2020 that really brought this movement to the forefront of everyone's consciousness. And now, two years later, I think we have um, lost some of the energy of that summer. Um, but if we are intentional about action and making Black Lives Matter, we can continue to harness that energy um, towards change. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, how structural racism shapes neighborhoods. I want to talk to you about gun violence as a deadly symptom of structural racism. And then I want to talk to you about place-based invest investments in black neighborhoods um, to promote health and safety. So this is the Urban Health Lab team, and five members of the team are here today. Can you guys wave your hands? Yes, amazing. So um, this is not all of our team, but this is a, a good portion of it. Um, Dean first emailed me in about a year ago, November of 2021. Um, I did not see the email for a while because he sent it to an email address that I admittedly don't check that often, which is the Urban Health Lab email address. <laughs> so he emailed in November and then he emailed again in December. I was just, you know, checking in to see if he saw this email. Um, I didn't see it till February. Um, yes. And so, um, but the email caught my eye because he not only invited me to come speak, but he invited the team. And I really, really appreciated that. It's the first time I've gotten an invitation like that. Um, and so I immediately wrote back and said, I'm so sorry it's been three months since you sent that. Is this, you know, is this um, invitation still open? Because to be able to bring my team here and for them to showcase the work they do is really, really special. So thank you, thank you so much. This is our vision, um, racial, environmental, and economic justice for black and brown people and neighborhoods. Um, I had, when I sort of took over the Urban Health Lab, it was just me and Kenny, um, who's, the, who's been with me the longest. And um, so we were a very small group. I sort of sat and wrote a mission and vision um, on my own. Once we had a larger team um, in April, um, Nikki, who's uh, the director, and I sort of presented this to the group to say, hey guys, this is our vision and mission. Um, just so you all are sort of aware of this. And the group was like, um, we don't really like this mission and vision. <laughs> and so we, we threw it out and together um, sort of went through an iterative process over uh, many months to come up with our new vision and mission. And so really proud of this. I think everyone on our team is really mission focused and passionate about the work. And that's the most important thing that sort of brings us together to, to do what we do. So to jump in, um, structural racism shapes neighborhoods. So the, the defining feature of American neighborhoods is segregation. That's just a fact. Um, and so whether you live on a tidy tree-lined street, whether you live in a neighborhood that is, has vacant lots, abandoned buildings, lots of trash, um, those spaces and places around us impact our health. And all of those factors are determined by structural racism. And so I wanna build a conceptual model for you that um, really shaped how I think about this connection between structural racism, segregation, and health, which is, you know, I'm a physician, and so I've always cared about health. Um, I, this is a model from Anna diaz Rue, who's the Dean of Public Health at Drexel in Philadelphia. Um, this came out in 2010 when I was just starting a research fellowship. And so this was really, and I'm still using this conceptual model today, this really was influential in how I think um, about all the work I do. You know, in medical training, in medical school, we don't learn any of this. It's all very individual. Um, and so that leaves a lot of people um, sort of walking away thinking that any health problems that people have is because of individual deficits, you know, because they smoke or they drink or, or this and that. Um, and so this was really a great frame shift for me to um, step away from the sort of individualized focus of health. 
And so in this model, the immediate drivers of health are stress and behavior. So of course our individual behavior influences our health. Um, but something we don't talk about enough is the way that stress in and of itself impacts health. So um, there's lots of evidence around this. You know, the experience of stress which can be good. You know, I, I had a little bit of stress this morning because I was gonna give a talk. So, but that's a good kind of stress to get you prepared. Um, but we all know that there's chronic and traumatic stress that um, a lot of people face that has harmful physiologic effects in our bodies. Um, so these are the immediate drivers of health. But then what determines stress and behavior? In this model is your neighborhood, where you live. And it's broken down into the physical environment and the social environment, um, but which of course in reality are intertwined, but for the purposes of this model are separated. But the real reason I love this model is because it goes that extra step to say and ask the question, well, why do our neighborhoods look the way they do? And the answer to that is um, segregation by race and socioeconomics and resource inequality. And underlying this model are of course individual characteristics because your biology, your genes, they do matter. Um, but in this model, they, they play, uh, they're sort of subsumed by these larger um, forces. So just to dig into a little bit to the segregation piece. Um, so this is a map of Philadelphia broken down by census tracts. Um, this was created by Emily Seberger, who's an amazing data analyst in our group. Um, and so, and this is showing the percentage of the population that's black um, in every census tract in Philadelphia. So the point here, so if we all lived together in the same places, the whole map would be the same color, but clearly it's not. And there are um, you know, neighborhoods that are predominantly black. And um, that's in West and Southwest Philadelphia and in North Philadelphia. And just to orient you to where Penn is, we sit like right here. So this is you know, showing how segregated our city is. This is not unique to Philadelphia. You can make a map like this in any city in the country and it basically will look the same. Why is our country so segregated? You know, obviously racism. Um, and so, you know, all of the major systems that we all exist in, um, housing, criminal justice, education, environment, um, healthcare, they're all shaped by structural racism and the history of structural racism. And so this is a definition of structural racism that I um, really like. It's a sort of a set of definitions. And um, it's about policies, um, institutional practices like um, that of university and cultural representations that work together in reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequities. Um, structural racism, we, we often you know, focus on the, um, the harm that people of color face because of structural racism, but we have to acknowledge the flip side of that, and that is that being white is a privilege. Whiteness is a privilege, and it conveys specific benefits. Um, and as was uh, you know, talked about yesterday a few times, you know, when you have extreme benefit on one side, you are going to have extreme harm on the other side, and that's what structural racism does. Um, it, shapes, it, it shapes everything. It shapes the world we all exist in, and in some ways it, um, it's tricky because it's often invisible if you're not looking for it. And, and so um, part, of, part of what I've been trying to do in you know, all the talks I, I, I give, and part of the reason why a conference like this is so important is because it makes the invisible visible. So we can acknowledge um, and interrogate the ways in which structural racism shows up in our daily lives and in our work. And structural racism is the root of racial health disparities. Um, in, you know, in academic medicine, um, Oftentimes, so work around health disparities has happened for a long time, but it's often been divorced from the concepts of racism and structural racism. Um, a year ago, there was a paper published that um, actually just looked how often in the top medical journals, JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, um, how often the word racism was used in papers and, and you know, in abstracts and titles in papers about um, health disparities, and it was very, very, very little. Um, people have stories about journal editors specifically um, asking them to take out the word racism from papers describing racial health disparities. And so, um, so you know, academic medicine has, um, I think, hid from, from this for a long time. Um, this is a quote from a really great paper that came out last year by Mary Bassett and Sandra Galeo about reparations as a public health strategy. And this quote is a great paper, um, but this quote really stuck with me because it talks about power, money, and access to resources 
which are three of the main ways that um, you know structural racism sort of uh, uh, works through mechanisms that it works through to influence health. And so, if we don't talk about power, if we don't talk about money, if we don't talk about access to resources, um, we're not going to be able to disrupt these things. Um, and so, just a brief piece about money. Um, I loved yesterday how Yasser sort of dropped at the end the reparations um, reparations bomb. That was amazing. So um, wealth is um, wealth is really important. This is this is the racial wealth gap in this country. It's pretty profound um, and hasn't changed over you know a century. And so um, this is the median net worth of households. Um, so this is not income. Wealth is different from income. This is um, uh, median net worth. Um, and you can see that the median net worth of white households hovers around 160, 170,000. The median net worth of black and Latino households is under $20,000, okay? Wealth is built intergenerationally. Um, and so um, this is, for a variety of reasons, um, something that has not changed over time and has profound causal effects on health and is related to concepts of investment and disinvestment in black neighborhoods. Um, this is a paper that myself and two <coughs> colleagues, Akeem ben Kadaramani and George Dalbert, wrote recently about um, the role that health systems as an institution can play in helping to close the racial um, wealth gap. And so um, health systems are not going to be able to do it on their own. The real thing we need is reparations. Uh, but we believe that health systems as an institution, and that could be extended to universities, um, have a role to play in addressing this wealth gap. Um, so back to structural racism and segregation, you know, why is this? Um, the choices that we have of where to live are constrained. It's not equal opportunity choices of where to live. They're constrained both by historical and present day factors, including um, federal, state, and local government policy, um, real estate practices, and bank lending practices. Those are probably the, the biggest buckets. And again, this is not just historical. I think we all know about redlining that happened years ago. Um, but current day real estate practices um, are racist. If you go to, um, in 2019, Newsday on Long Island published an investigative journalism article about um, where they, have, they sent secret shoppers to a bunch of real estate agents across the island and basically showed that um, couples of color were steered to um, uh, neighborhoods that were predominantly of color, predominantly black. White couples were steered to white neighborhoods. Um, these uh, people had, the, the secret shoppers all had the same like financial profile. They're, they were literally the same other than who showed up. Um, that was in 2019. Bank lending practices, um, just Google Wells Fargo, Baltimore, um, 2008, and you'll see a whole, a whole lot about how the, one of the biggest banks in the country was um, targeting um, black and Latino families. And um, this is also really important, again, to, to say that white families have benefited from um, segregation and structural racism. So um, Javarian yesterday talked about it wasn't white flight, it was the white people were pulled to the suburbs. And what we don't talk about enough is that the, the white-only suburbs were built with government money. The government subsidized the creation of the white-only suburbs and made them white-only. Literally written into the deeds of the houses that were built, it said you could not sell this house to a non-white family. Um, so that's investment. That was investment that went into building white neighborhoods. Um, while there was the equal and opposite disinvestment in black neighborhoods. Um, the Federal Housing Administration, which you know really changed the game on home ownership, um, uh, they of all the mortgages that they backed between the 1930s and 1960s, 98 percent of them went to white families. And then things colorblind um, economic investments, such as the GI Bill, Social Security, were nonetheless sort of structured in a way that they largely benefited white individuals and white families. So again, it's just really important to um, sort of call out and recognize the ways in which white families have benefited from the thing that had been so destructive for black families and black neighborhoods. And then I, I didn't create this um, image. I found this in a paper, but I love it, um, to remind us all why this is still so important. So we had 250 years of slavery in this country. We had another 100 years of 
on Jim Crow and legalized uh, segregation. So it's only been, you know, I'm not going to do a math on the spot, but like 70 <laughs> years or so um, that we have, uh, um, in the eyes of the law, all been equal. So 70 years compared to 350 years, um, we have a lot of work to do. It's going to take a lot of time to undo what was um, sort of built into this country over time. So I want to pause and actually just have some ask you all some questions, and maybe one or two people wouldn't mind sharing. Um, you know, how have you and your family either benefited from or been harmed by legacies of structural racism in the U.S.? Um, how do the realities of racial and economic segregation show up in your work? Um, or anything else you want to say or comment on? Thank you. Uh, well, one thing that part of reparative justice is uh, to, to honor our forefathers. And so here in Winston Salem, we have uh, amazing history in terms of um, health care and health education that we generated internally within the Black. So I think it's important to honor the founder of Mr. Sales Day for not being lost in um, Samuel, uh, Simon and Atkins because the first nursing program and the first hospital for African Americans was at Slater, our original school. It wasn't sustainable over time, but when it opened, and I can't recall the date now, uh, Booker T. Washington came out. And this is interesting. So um, the Reynolds came, they actually even gave their parents and they came to China um, for the reception. Um, but it wasn't sustainable, right? And then eventually the KP Reynolds Hospital was established. Um, but it was uh, it was the African American hospital, but it closed in 71. But why was that hospital so important? We can just think about what Dean Walker said last night. So uh, what happened with the murder of Mr. James Eller in 67, he went to Lake Point. He went to Baptist, and he went to what is now Lamont, and they said, no, we've x-rayed you, there's nothing wrong. Then he went to KP Reynolds, they found the fracture, and he died. Now that hospital, um, our founder, he had to mediate, I believe in the 20s, because there was a bill, this speaks to your structural racism, there was a bill put out for people to vote on here locally, which would have had a black director of the hospital. But Dr. Atkins knew if that happened, that then the hospital would never be, whenever the evaluators would come, it, it, it would not happen, right? They get negative um, evaluations and then they close. And so he had to go around town and tell people, do not vote for this staff. That's very manipulative. But until that hospital closed in 71, it had the best practice for containing infection in the whole country. Black and white residents came from all over, and yet that hospital closed, right? And so now, of course, the South State has the premier nursing program, um, but we continue to just see these inequities. The potential had been so high, right? And then racism, people were very strategic in making sure that Slater, Slater Hospital and then later on our KP Reynolds Hospital yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, there is a very interesting history in this country about um, hospitals, hospital desegregation, and that was really led by black um, physicians, nurses, and dentists. Um, and through, there's a connection between the passage of Medicare and hospital desegregation. That's a really interesting story that I encourage you all to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one more. I saw your hands go up. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is James Grace. I'm a resident, lifelong resident of Winston Salem. My family has been in the construction business all my life. So after I left, uh, got out of the war, Vietnam War, came back home, uh, didn't think I was going to work for the construction company because it was hard labor. So, uh, but my dad was sick. To make a long story short, I got into business. We got booming because I had been educated and all of this stuff. And, 
we made some inroads and then Nixon came along and passed set aside laws and the white contractors in town just stopped using us period so we lost everything and that's just you know sort of one significant tidbit the other is being a part of the civil rights movement in Western Salem I went to school in Greensboro and witnessed how people responded to the civil rights movement meaning that all of the leaders had to get together around one table which meant that they got to know one another. In Western Salem, it was different. Corporate America addressed all of the issues and started these uh, governmental organizations like Experiment and Self-Reliance and all of those things. So today, still, the leadership, black leadership in Western Salem are still alienated. They're just pockets of them that don't work together. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, your experience of describing how you had this like thriving family business and then some policies and laws change and, and that went away, um, it happens over and over again. And um, as you know, black communities and black people have built wealth, it's often uh, taken away, sometimes through very violent means, and that is, a, um, again, a um, pattern in our country. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so we're gonna shift to the, this middle part, which is about gun violence. And um, I, you know, this is a topic that's very near and dear to me as an emergency medicine physician who takes care of um, victims of gun violence. And this is a public health crisis. And if the public health crisis was made worse by COVID, um, this is a paper that shows um, in Philadelphia shootings. And that dotted line is when COVID started. And so you can see the, the sharp rise in shootings in Philadelphia. And this is, um, this is not just Philadelphia, this happened in cities across the country. Um, some people have tried to blame this rise in Philadelphia on our like very progressive DA in Philadelphia, um, but it, it's not that, it's across the country. So um, my colleagues and I in the ER felt this before we knew the data, because what used to be you know once every few day occurrence um, was every day, multiple times a day, and um, that's, why people often call like what's happening in the ER the canary in the coal mine because we see things before it's sort of known widely. Um, I don't know a lot about Winston Salem. It's been a lot to. It's been great to learn more. Um, but just a quick Google search um, about gun violence in Winston Salem um, told me that this uh, trip, this rise has happened here too, um, and that gun violence is something that a lot of people here are thinking about. Um, most victims of gun violence are young black men. Um, homicide is the leading cause of death for black males in this country from age 1 to 44. The leading cause of death. This is, th these are numbers from Philadelphia, um, and this is sort of representative about what happens across the country. And gun violence is a place-based problem that's concentrated in black neighborhoods, which is why I call this a deadly symptom of structural racism. So this is that same map of Philadelphia, and each of the red dots is um, the location of a fatal shooting in 2020. And so you can see how um, shootings are concentrated in black neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And then this, that other sort of clustering in North Philadelphia is a predominantly Latino area. Um, interestingly, as I told you before, Penn is right here. And you can see this like invisible wall around Penn where there are no shootings. And um, I think that speaks to actually the themes of this conference. Why is that? Right? Um, what has Penn done to create this invisible wall and let all the things that happen outside the wall happen over there, but not, not here? Um, so more questions for you all to uh, contemplate. Um, so the thing about segregation is it's not just about the segregation of people, it's about the concentration of resources for some and the concentration of risk for others. And those are the root causes of gun violence. Um, a common narrative that I hear in the emergency department is sort of about bad people doing bad things. And that's not what gun violence is. Um, what you have in neighborhoods that have been segregated is concentrated poverty, lack of economic opportunity, failing public schools, mass incarceration and police surveillance, and deteriorating neighborhood environments. Those are all the root causes of gun violence. And so, um, you know, our work is really focused on these root causes. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna talk about our work that is around neighborhood environments. Um, and then 
this is really important because gun violence has such a profound impact on our neighborhoods and in our neighborhoods. 50% um, of black children in this country have heard or witnessed shootings in their neighborhoods. Um, we know that gun violence is associated with increased depression, anxiety, PTSD. It's actually also associated with physical health problems like cardiovascular disease. Um, and we know, um, uh, myself and a colleague did a study last year where we showed that um, when you have a shooting on a block, in the immediate aftermath of that shooting, in the first uh, you know, seven days, let's say, for kids that live in that block and the block surrounding it, you have an increase in mental health visits to the emergency room. So there's like this immediate connection between exposures to shooting and what uh, kids are experiencing. Now, you, they don't go to the emergency room and say, there's a shooting on my block, I'm very stressed. They go with symptoms and um, there's, and so I think physicians often are unaware of what's happening in our neighborhoods um, and why people are coming to see them. And then the last thing I'll say about this is that there is secondary trauma for the healthcare workforce because of gun violence, and I've experienced that myself. Um, and so this is, this is a really a big problem that in, impacts um, all of us. And so we'd love to hear from one or two of you all, you know, how has gun violence impacted your career in any way? And then given that, like Penn in Philadelphia, universities and health systems are often situated in or adjacent to segregated black neighborhoods, what is our responsibility to address something like gun violence? So I, I grew up in Los, uh, South Central Los Angeles. I, I actually was a visiting professor at UK in 2010. I was coming from Lancaster and was struck uh, by the bomb because I would catch the yep. Keystone line in, walk through Drexel from the uh, station, 34th Street, you know, whatever, 34th Street. And then walked to Penn, and, and I was struck just how strong that bubble was. But growing up in, in Watts in South Central Los Angeles, uh, gun violence was so prevalent that not only was it commonplace to hear gun fire, but we all, you know, in, in the time that I lived there up until I was a young adult, I could name five friends who had been murdered mm -hmm. in our neighborhood on the very streets that we saw, uh, or that we you know, traversed on a daily basis. And that was a neighborhood linking to the first reflection that my grandmother and grandfather moved to. They migrated from, from Louisiana, Central Louisiana in 1937, bought their first house there after accumulating their money in uh, uh, 1950, moved into that house and got which was a working class white neighborhood mm -hmm. in 1946 when the house was, was built to so-called white flight. Uh, but they were being told, move out, and they were up charging the homes. So my grandmother and grandfather paid $8,000 <coughs> for this home, and their black friend said, why are you paying that much money to live in that white neighborhood? That would, of course, turn and become a black neighborhood. They could, she never sold the house. She's 94 years old, yeah, still wow. lives there. Mm -hmm. And so she will never reap the, the financial benefit mm -hmm. of that house. And she saw the neighborhood change in significant ways and in violent ways for many, many years. So uh, how that impacts the work that I do, I'm, I'm, I uh, direct the center here at Wake Forest University called the Center for Research, Engagement, and Collaboration in African American Rock Life. I also do work around uh, African American food culture and African American religion. A lot of these questions and issues that you're bringing up interplay with the work that we're doing, somewhat through the central on the ground, but also through the east. So thank you so much. For yeah, no, thank you for that. I it's it's so interesting to hear sort of very personal family stories that just bear out what we know sort of happened across the country. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Yes, that has been a bit of my career. As a person who has never experienced gun violence. Uh, it's a stress, stress in our communities and what makes it very stressed. Uh, people don't perform better at school. They perform worse at exams and then I can get better positions and my kids can get better calls at schools and things like that. So yes, benefit. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the um, next piece and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So um, hopefully 
that sort of set up for you why um, I and my team have really focused on place-based investments in black neighborhoods um, to promote health and safety. Um, these are two op-eds that I wrote that I'm very proud of. There's probably things that I've written in the life press that I'm, I'm the most proud of um, that uh, summarize what I believe in and what I do. And so this one in the Washington Post is Black Lives Matter really matter, we must invest in black neighborhoods. And I think, um, you know, coming out of the summer of 2020, one of the impacts of that for me was to really sharpen my language and to be very clear about um, who I am who I care about and what I'm working on in a way that I hadn't before. I actually um, went back to a paper that we published in 2018 that I'm gonna show you, showing that vacant black reading has an impact on gun violence and mental health. Um, I went back and I'm very embarrassed to say that I didn't use the word racism in there. Yeah. And, and and I can say that's because I was a I was a product of the environment that I was, you know, in in academia. Um, and but that doesn't happen anymore. So now the word racism is all over <laughs> everything that I do. And actually one of the things I do when I'm reviewing papers or grants um, is to do a control R test, control racism or control F racism, um, because I want to see like are we using the, the right language here. Um, this other one was in the New York Times. Um, so one thing about writing op-eds is that you don't you usually don't have control over the title of the op-ed. <laughs> and so I really don't like the title of that op-ed, but I didn't have any control over it. This one, they actually let me um, say the, the title. Um, I think the other thing I'll say about this is that I think writing is such a powerful tool um, to get ideas out, to change narratives, um, and to um, influence, to have influence. In. And, um, and so that's why I really enjoyed writing, um, and particularly writing op-eds in the light press. So what am I talking about when I talk about sort of neighborhood environments? So things like abandoned buildings. Um, Philadelphia is a city of row houses, um, which I know is very different from the landscape here, but um, we have you know, streets that look like this, um, where you have abandoned buildings that are either boarded up or blown out windows, and you also have people living in between um, in these spaces. Um, it looks like this. This is a vacant lot in Philadelphia. We have a ton of these. Um, they're often uh, filled with trash. Um, people, we have a huge problem with illegal dumping, so contractors from who knows where will take their materials and come and just back up into a vacant lot and dump stuff there. Um, or vacant lots in the growing season when weeds are growing may look like this, and this is unwanted vegetation. Um, you may have industrial plants. So these are all the sort of uh, pieces of the neighborhood environment. When I first moved to Philadelphia in 2010, um, which is when I started learning about all of this, I heard that there were 40,000 vacant lots and abandoned buildings in Philadelphia. And I said, there's no way. That has to be a zero. Like if an extra zero was added, you mean 4,000, right? And no, 40,000 in the city of Philadelphia, vacant lots and abandoned buildings. And place impacts people, um, which is why place is so important. This is a quote from um, one of the first studies I did, actually the first study I did when I moved to Philadelphia, which was a qualitative study where I talked to residents and um, who lived in neighborhoods with um, high levels of vacancy in West and Southwest Philadelphia. Um, and I wanted to know what they, what was the impact, like what impact did they feel from these spaces? And this person really crystallized um, that, that connection between people and place. Um, this person said, it makes me feel not important. Like I think that your surroundings, your environment, vacant land affects your mood, it affects your train of thought, your emotions, and seeing vacant lots and abandoned buildings, to me that's a sign of neglect, so I feel neglected. So for some people, um, when they walk out of their homes, they have to fight a, a sense of neglect by what they're seeing around them. And that neglect is directly tied to the legacy and ongoing disinvestment that has happened in neighborhoods that has allowed the conditions of vacancy to, uh, to be rampant. And so um, a lot of my work has focused on um, simple structural place-based interventions. And what we have shown and found is that these interventions um, have a big impact on violence prevention. They're not the only thing. It's one piece in you know, what, what needs to be a full complement of interventions at different levels. Um, but I think this is um, one piece of violence prevention that often gets forgotten. And so um, you know, 
my reason for writing those op-eds that I did was to raise the sort of collective consciousness about the importance of our surroundings and some simple sort of proven interventions that we know can work. So I'm only gonna talk about trees and vacant lot greening today for time, but we have done work showing um, the impact of abandoned house remediation on um, gun violence. We actually have a paper coming out in JAMA Internal Medicine next month that shows um, in a randomized controlled trial that gun violence goes down after you remediate abandoned houses. And then we've done work um, around structural repairs to occupied homes. So homes that people are living in, we've done work showing that if you do structural repairs to those houses, which I think about as sort of micro investments into the neighborhood, there is an association with a drop in gun violence. And the more homes on a block that you repair, the steeper the drop in gun violence. Again, there's sort of micro investments, this concept of investing in a neighborhood. Um, so to focus on trees, I never thought I'd be doing work on trees. Um, I'm not really like a nature person um, in my nature, but, yeah, but the, I followed the evidence and this is where the evidence brought me. So trees, it turns out, are a really vital aspect of neighborhood infrastructure. Um, I love this picture that I found on Google Maps one time when I was looking up where I was going for a community meeting because I imagine it's sort of a hot summer day and people are gathering and congregating and they're doing so under this big, uh, magnificent tree, probably because it provides shade and it's hot outside and a lot of people don't have air conditioning. So coming outside, gathering under this tree, and you can imagine how in the process of doing that, social connections are formed. People are building you know, the fabric of, um, of relationships on their block. And you can actually see down the street, and I don't think there's any other trees on that street. Um, you can sort of see trees in the background over here. But trees are important. Um, there's a big disparity in temperature within cities. So on a given you know, hot summer day in Philadelphia, there's up to a 15 degree temperature differential in different neighborhoods of the city, um, largely determined by tree canopy, um, also determined by some other built environment factors. Um, but that heat differential has like immediate health consequences. We know when it's really hot, there's more emergency department visits. Um, and so trees are important for heat and then of course for um, sort of air pollution. But trees are patterned by race and income. Surprise, surprise, something that's beneficial. And so these are some screenshots um, from a New York Times um, article from a couple years ago that I found so fascinating. And what they did was they took these satellite pictures within the same city, they showed the sort of poorest neighborhoods and the richest neighborhoods and showed the tree cover differential. And they did this for cities across the country. This is, again, not unique to any city. In, on the west coast in Portland, on the east coast in Baltimore, um, and all cities in between, you can see this profound difference in the relationship between tree canopy and income. And then this is a study from last year um, that I was not involved in, but I really appreciate showing the relationship between neighborhoods that were redlined in the 1930s and present day tree canopy. And so along the sort of x-axis in the bottom here, you're going from the least amount of green space to the most amount of green space. And then up the y-axis, you're going from um, D-rated neighborhoods, which were the ones that were redlined and ineligible for any kind of, any kind of government-backed investment, um, which is also related to private investment, and then up to A-rated neighborhoods, which were the best neighborhoods with excellent prospects and no Negroes or foreigners. And you can see this, um, this relationship between the um, neighborhoods that were redlined compared to neighborhoods that got the best rating and the amount of tree canopy today. So again, these connections between history and present day conditions. And then finally, this was a study I was involved in showing the um, association between tree cover and adolescent gun assault. Um, and so this study was led by a colleague, Michelle Kondo and Doug Weed. And this was a study where they, um, they enrolled about 250 adolescents in Philadelphia um, who had been assaulted with a gun, and then 250 adolescents who were similar in demographics but were not assaulted. And they had each of them trace their paths throughout the day leading up to when they were assaulted or the same time of day for the control group. And um, they, there was a lot of interesting um, stuff that came out of that, but what we did was we overlaid tree canopy cover with the path points of where um, kids were, were throughout their day. And so we were able to, to um, sort of calculate how much tree canopy they were under at the time of the shooting and leading up to that. And what we found was that um, being under trees or being near trees was protective against gun assault. Um, but only during the leaf growing season. And so it was not protective when there were no leaves on the trees. 
Um, so only when there were leaves on the trees. And then in addition, there's a lot of evidence, some of which um, have been produced by um, me and mentees and, and colleagues, um, about other benefits of trees. So, which is probably why, all these other benefits is probably why it has an impact on gun violence, better mental, mental health, better um, lower rates of hypertension, diabetes, and maternal health outcomes. Um, so we, myself and a colleague, Heather Burris, have a R01 that's, we're, we're actually studying the relationship between tree canopy and um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, which is a uh, pregnancy outcome that's related to disparities in um, black, white, maternal morbidity and mortality. So trees are um, important. Time check here, okay, great. So moving on to vacant lot mining. Um, so this is a picture of a typical vacant lot in Philadelphia. And this is a picture of that same vacant lot after the greening intervention. Um, very simple intervention, removing the trash, planting grass, a couple of trees, and then this wooden post and rail fence around the perimeter that does have openings. So you can go inside the space to use it, um, but that, that fence helps to prevent illegal dumping, which is the um, purpose of that fence, as well as sort of denote the space that this is now a space that's being taken care of. Um, this um, intervention was actually really pioneered by a CDC in Kensington in a neighborhood in Philadelphia and then in partnership with the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. And um, so this has been a, an intervention that the city has done for, paid for for almost 10 years as a way to deal with vacant spaces. Um, these are some more pictures of before and after <clears throat> the vacant lot cleaning intervention. Um, this is my, uh, one of my mentors, my main mentor, Charlie Brannis, who when I came to Penn in 2010, he was, you know, we were paired together um, based on some mutual interests. And he sort of laid out all the things he was working on and said, what do you want to work on? He was just starting to think about these place-based interventions, and I had never thought about that before. Um, and so picked that as the thing I, I wanted to explore. And so my fellowship project involved a pilot randomized control trial of this intervention. Um, and then this is Keith Green, who now directs the land care program at PHS. But back when I met him, I don't remember what his title was, but he was at PHS. He drove me around to Philadelphia and like told me the story of every block. Um, really, sort of, you know, I was new to the area, didn't know anything, um, and was really instrumental in helping me sort of learn about Philadelphia and particularly West and Southwest Philadelphia. So I, I work with him to this day, which is um, really awesome. And so all of this work culminated in a citywide randomized control trial of vacant lot greening. Um, as far as we know, this was the first sort of place-based randomized control trial of its kind. So instead of randomizing people, which is typically what you do in an RCT, we randomize places. And um, because of the location of where vacant lots are in Philadelphia, this was this study happened in majority black neighborhoods. Um, we interviewed people um, who lived near the lots before and after, and then we looked at police reported crime. Um, the three interventions that we studied were the full cleaning and greening intervention with uh, bi-weekly maintenance, just cleaning, so not the greening, but just cleaning, picking up trash, and then lots that didn't get any intervention. And so this sort of summarizes um, this work in one slide. And so first, just to draw your attention to what we found was up to a 29% drop in gun violence around lots that received any intervention, even the, just the trash pickup or the full greening intervention. And the, the results were the strongest in the poorest neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods that have been the most disinvested from had the most to gain from this like very simple, relatively low cost intervention. Um, but we also found some other interesting findings. So people that live near the Lhasa got the intervention um, who didn't know that this is what we were doing. We just um, interviewed people, didn't tell them what the intervention was. Um, they reported going outside more and socializing with their neighbors more. So this connection between the environment and what's happening around you and the ability for people to form social connections, um, which is very important for violence prevention. And then the other um, results that I love from this study was just around lots that were greened, um, people that lived around those lots reported less feelings of depression. And so this connection, this sort of confirms this connection around nature and um, mental health, mental health symptomology. Um, this wasn't a diagnosis of depression, just feelings of depression, and um, shows that you can make these small changes to the environment and have a, an impact on people's experience of their neighborhood. 
And the, the beauty of this is that this was a randomized controlled trial, so we can say there was a causal link between the intervention that we did and the outcomes that we saw. All right, so I'm gonna move now into the last piece of this and to talk about two current um, projects that we're doing in the Urban Health Lab. One is, one is called Ignite, um, and one is called Deeply Rooted. Um, Abby is the project manager for Ignite. Um, so first for Ignite. So this is sort of a culmination of um, all of the work that we did. And actually, there's direct connections between me writing those two op-eds that I showed you and then sort of turning those ideas that I was talking about into a grant. Um, and writing those op-eds helped me to sort of think through and solidify some of my thoughts around this. And so this is the, the title of this study. It's a randomized controlled trial of concentrated investment in black neighborhoods to address structural racism as a fundamental cause of poor health. So you can see the connection between the op-ed titles and then the, the grant title here. Um, and we, we were very um, uh, explicit about what we were doing, what we were trying to do. So this is a nearly $10 million NIH award. We're in our uh, second year now. And this is run by myself and my colleague, Athene ben Kataramadi, who runs a really awesome lab called the Opportunity for Health Lab. Um, we actually went to medical school together. We went to WashU um, from, from medical school and um, lost touch for many, many years. I ran into him in the hall at Penn a couple years ago, and we sort of reconnected, um, always uh, appreciated the other person's work, and were able to combine our work for this, for this study. And so what we're doing in this study is um, a big push investment, a sort of concentrated investment. We have taken 60 randomly selected clusters, which are four by four blocks, um, and we chose the areas based on the percentage of um, black population in the census tract where these blocks are, and then, um, and then as a subset of that, the, the blocks that had the lowest um, income. So we're really trying to focus on the hardest hit, most segregated black neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And then we are enrolling um, 720 adults, um, and we're doing that by knocking on doors. Um, and Andre, who's here from our team, is one of the uh, people who's going out to talk to people, knock on doors, and get people enrolled in our, in our study. Um, and so what are we doing? So there's a suite of economic focus interventions and a suite of environmental interventions. So from the environmental side, we're combining all the things that we've studied in isolation, vacant lot greening, abandoned house remediation, tree planting, and trash pickup. Um, and so each of these, in each of these clusters, um, this will happen in the cluster. Um, trash pickup, by the way, is actually really important. Philadelphia has a lot of trash, um, but some neighborhoods like Center City, you don't see the trash. And that's because they hire people to pick up the trash every day. So, but if, when you live in a neighborhood without resources, you don't have people to pick up the trash. So it's not, I think some people would look at this and be like, oh, you know, those people are so, they don't care about their environment, they just throw trash. That's not true, everyone throws trash in Philadelphia, we're a dirty city. But some people, I, I don't know why that is, but it is. Some people, um, some neighborhoods have resources to pick up after people and others don't. So we are um, essentially doing what they do in Center City with this and there's gonna be a crew of people that goes around on a weekly basis to pick up all the trash that had, that's on the ground. Um, this is not like trash pickup, like people put their trash out. Another thing that happens is like people put their trash out then the garbage um, men come and put the trash in the trucks, but it like goes all over the place and they don't pick it up. So um, that, this will help with that. And then for the households in the same neighborhoods that we're doing these environmental interventions, um, we have a suite of four um, economic focus interventions, including tax preparation, um, to help people get the most money back into um, from their taxes, and so you know money back into their pockets, connection to public benefits, um, up to sort of forty percent of families in Philadelphia are not maxed out on the public benefits that they're eligible for. There's a lot of access issues, so um, by sort of going to the people, we're hoping to be able to connect them to benefits, um, financial counseling, and then a one-time emergency cash grant of four hundred dollars. Um, this is our investigator team. Um, uh, me and Athena are up there with the MPIs. George Dallenberg, who's a pediatrician at CHOP, is the one who really pioneered the sort of concept of a medical financial partnership. And so we're using a lot of that in, in the um, intervention here. And then this is our amazing study team, um, with some members of whom are here today. And then finally, I want to tell you about Deeply Rooted, um, which is really about turning research into action. 
So, you know, we've created all of this research and knowledge at Penn about um, interventions that we know work. And um, I wanted to take that and say, well, if we know it works, then we should be doing it and we should be putting money into things that we know work. And so this is a um, community academic collaborative that really uses the healing power of nature to promote health and well-being in black and brown Philadelphia neighborhoods. Um, this is a $6 million effort that's funded by Penn Medicine, the health system, and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I think it's a great example of health systems starting to um, invest in a way that is going to be community focused and is, uh, is trying to um, you know, elevate neighborhoods without displacing people. So the goal here is not displacement, and that's why we are um, working so closely with our community partners to really guide everything that's happening um, in DC rooted. Now, six million dollars, I don't know if that sounds like a lot or a little, it's really not a lot <laughs> compared to all the money that Penn Medicine has, but this is a start. Um, this is a start. And a lot of, I see a lot of my role as trying to funnel as much money as possible, you know, from my institution back directly into our neighborhoods. So we have four focus areas. Um, we are working with communities to empower communities to just create new green space. And that includes planting trees, greening vacant lots, and building mini parks. Um, we have another project that I didn't talk about um, called the Nature and Wellbeing Project that Kenny is a project manager for. Um, and she's gonna talk a little bit more about in the workshop that the team is doing after this. Um, but we have this really awesome sort of community co-designed process for turning uh, vacant lots into mini parks um, and uh, in, in our neighborhood. So we're gonna be able to do that, um, replicate that in DC Rooted. We're providing grants to community organizations and residents um, to do anything related to nature in any form or fashion. As, as long as there's some like loose connection, we wanna fund people. Um, and so we, we just had our uh, first round of this, and so we are providing $50,000 worth of grants to just people, residents, um, and leaders of small community groups who often are doing this work and paying for it out of their own pockets. And so we really just want to be able to build capacity and support people who are doing important work in their neighborhoods. So these grants range from $600 to $3,000. Um, this is the first round, and we'll be having multiple rounds of this. Um, and then we're gonna, this is, we haven't developed this piece out yet, uh, but we're gonna have a piece around career development and um, leadership opportunities. And then um, advocating for policies and neighborhood investments that promote environmental justice. The, the main thing that has bubbled up from our conversations with our community partners is land justice and land ownership, who gets to own land um, and who gets to do what with land. We had an experience in a park in, um, Actually, this is a picture of our of Memorial Garden. Um, this is a painted plant day we did. This space has been in the community's hands for 20 years, was created as a memorial to a man who was shot in this like formerly vacant lot, stewarded by a community group called Urban Tree Connection. And um, as we were putting flyers up for um, this community event, Kenny actually is the one who found this like small sign on the fence that said, you know, this land has been sold and it's going to be developed. Um, and our partner, Urban Tree Connection, didn't even know about it. And so it turns out that this space that has been a community asset for 20 years um, was put up for development for affordable housing. Um, affordable housing is very important. There are a lot of vacant lots in Philadelphia where you could put affordable housing um, and not in a space that is not a vacant, you know, in the city's records, this is a vacant lot but it's not as a thriving community space. So um, we also sort of work with them to, um, to canvas and get uh, uh, petitioning, get residents to sign a petition um, to testify. Nikki testified at a land bank hearing um, to try to reverse this um, decision, which we have not been able to do. Half of the, the land through this process has been given to Urban Tree Connection, but half is still slated for development. And um, it's a really beautiful space. It's, it's, a, it's a shame that that's happening. Anyway, um, so what we're gonna, our initial sort of three-year metrics for deeply rooted is to plant 1,500 trees, green and maintain and million square feet of vacant land, provide 200 community grants, and then career development opportunities. And all of the sort of decisions about what to do, where to do it, is um, really driven by our community partners. So for example, the community grants, um, who got their grants was decided by our community partners. So we, 
we're, we administered it, you know, we advertised it, we brought our, all the information together, but then our partners got together and uh, made the decision about who's gonna get the money. And then we had a really awesome kickoff event, um, Garden Fest, that Kenny turned into an event planner and <laughs> planned this event. Um, we actually had, we're, we're in four neighborhoods in Philadelphia, King Sussing, Haddington, Cobbs Creek, and Mill Creek. Um, Philadelphia, as many cities, is like a city of small neighborhoods. And so we're in four neighborhoods, and we have a lead partner, which is a CDC in each of those neighborhoods, and then several core partners who are school and faith institutions. Um, but this was our, um, our kickoff event last spring, um, and we had um, one of our city council um, women, Councilwoman Gautier, who's a great supporter, and our, the CEO of our health system, Kevin Mahoney. So the very last thing, I just wanted to show you a quick video about Keeping Rooted. Every time we step out of our house, the places and spaces around us are That's having more impact on us, on our thought processes, our moods, our emotions, and even our biology. When you look at a space that's been quieted and overrun with weeds and nobody's invested anything into it, you may walk past it and it may even make you have like a bad mood. Looking at the vacant lots, right, as a young person, when you're just walking by, they just become desensitized to it. They're not a part of the community. Deeply Rooted is a joint initiative funded by both Penn Medicine and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that is trying to leverage what we know to be the healing power of nature to promote health and safety in black and brown Philadelphia neighborhoods. Green spaces are important for events, to have social gatherings, to have other functions, and the green spaces that we have are a lot of spaces, and a lot of those are abandoned, riddled with trash, and just not accessible to us to have our typical gatherings. We did the first large-scale randomized control trial of vacant lot greening. We took vacant lots that were blighted with trash, overgrown weeds, dumping, and turned them into clean and green spaces. And what we found was remarkable. These spaces led to reductions in gun violence, up to 29% in neighborhoods below the poverty line. People living nearby reported to us that they felt less depressed. So there was this really strong connection between simple environmental interventions and people's mental health. We're deeply rooted. We're going to be building mini parks throughout West and Southwest Philly. We're also going to have community activation grants to support environmental justice. And we're going to be developing a leadership and workforce development program. Our lead green space implementation partner is the Pennsylvania Port and Cultural Society. They're the ones who will be planting the trees, bringing the vacant lots. It's the more best for the environment, you know, because it kind of makes you more healthy and clean, you see. So if we have more things like this, I think it will be more benefit to the community. And doing this together as a community as well, but something that's fun, right? Something that's enjoyable. Like, we can talk about green things. Like, it's cool. You learn a new tool, and if you have green thumb, you learn how to plant, or you're enhancing those skills. So it's a lot to offer for a lot of different people which is great because then you really start to touch the community too. Community members really need to be at the center of all of this because they know their community best. When we started clearing out those weeds behind the hoop house, the rest of this is going in the next <coughs> week or so. All of this has been done in the last two weeks. Hopefully we'll make this a beautiful space and make it a place that our community wants to come we have a park over there. We can actually call in some young youth to come and help with the plants, some trees, and you understand? So we kind of keep their mind focused on a different thing, you know? So we want to make sure that our community know how to plant, know how to grow on their own, so that they're able to build their own food and be able to sell those things. I want parents That's in all husband. of our neighborhoods to <laughs> send their kids out to play green space. <laughs> We chose the name Deeply Rooted to reference the groundedness and the strength that is already in our community and the neighborhood. This is starting something really wonderful, something really huge, and it's going to pick up so much momentum. I'm, just, I'm excited. Okay, 
So, this is my last slide. Um, this is what I just want to leave you with, that um, place matters, and it matters because it impacts all of us, it impacts people. Um, and if black lives are going to matter, then we have to invest in black people. Thank you.